start it here. Okay. All right. It looks like people are definitely coming in and providing these answers, and thank you all for doing that. And so that being said, we'll go ahead and uh, go into our presentation here. Okay. I'll make this a little bit bigger. But I wanted to welcome everyone, and thank you all for joining today's webinar, Building Relationships Between Communities and Police, What Prosecutors Need to Know. Uh, my name is William Moore with OJJDP's INTAC. I wanted to just go over a few housekeeping uh, items just to keep in mind. Um, please note that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, and will be available at a later time on a, our YouTube channel. We'll provide the link to where we'll uh, have it available for everyone. Uh, we also, uh, please note that we have documents located in the handouts pod here where you can easily uh, log in and you can actually uh, download important items and documents that are related to today's uh, discussion. Uh, simply click on the name of the file and then click the download button. Uh, please note that you'll also be able to submit any questions that you may have for our uh, panel and for our presenters today. Uh, by doing so, what you can do is just take your question and put it into the chat box, hit enter or the bubble there, uh, and it will submit your question, and we uh, will hopefully be able to address your question at the end of today's uh, presentation. Uh, folks that are logged on, please note that you will indeed receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, the certificate of attendance will uh, notify that you were on for today. Uh, if individuals who are looking to possibly uh, get certificates for other individuals who are on, you may fill out the uh, group validation form that we have available for you. You can let us know who's joined you in your group there. Um, for those who are uh, joined in the group, uh, usually people will join the webinars by themselves, but if you're joined in the group, please let us know that you're in the group by letting us know the additional people that are in the room with you today. You may do so by just typing that in the chat box. Simply type in the total number of additional people in the room with you, so not including yourself. You can say, okay, I'm here with one other person, two other people, so on and so forth. That being said, uh, looking for a great webinar and a great discussion for today. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Susan Brodick, for today's web event. Susan, take it away. Thank you so much, William. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Susan Broderick, and I am currently a senior attorney at the National District Attorneys Association. Um, I started my career as a prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office back in 1989. I was a prosecutor there for 14 years. Uh, moved to D.C. I've been working with prosecutors for my entire professional career, and it's um, an honor and a privilege to um, be moderating this panel discussion today, uh, building relationships between communities and police, what prosecutors need to know. Um, I do want to apologize in advance for my background here. I am in my nephew's bedroom right now because we had a power outage here on Long Island. So um, I had to make do. So I am live from uh, Joey's bedroom. <laughs> and um, But I want to really thank all of you. We've gotten um, an overwhelming number of attendees um, calling in for this. And, and we know that so over the last several months, and starting really with the death of George Floyd, there has been um, a lot of renewed attention on calls to reform the justice system, to bring, make changes with law enforcement. And those of us working within the justice system know that one of, one of the most critical elements of any plan forward is working on building relationships between police and communities they serve. And while some might say that we are in a crisis state right now, um, one of my favorite things is that conflict precedes clarity. And I, I do think there are a lot of opportunities right now. While things may seem dismal, um, there are a lot of opportunities 
to bring about positive change right now. And today, we are so lucky to have three people who are actually out there working on positive change every single day. Um, they are working to bring real-life solutions to some of the major problems that we are currently facing. So I'm honored to have had the opportunity to work with all three of these individuals. Um, our first presenter is um, Fred Watts. And Fred is currently the director of the Police Athletic League of New York City. Fred was a prosecutor for over 30 years in the Manhattan DA's office, and that's how I got to know Fred. Um, after one year at a private firm, he was appointed by Mr. Morgenthau, where he remained a prosecutor under Mr. Morgenthau and later under Cyrus Vance. Uh, Fred Watts began his prosecutorial career handling all types of violent crime, including the investigation and prosecution of sexual assaults and homicide cases. He was promoted to supervisory positions and served as key executive in the office for over 20 years. Mr. Watts' additional professional and communities activities have included active participation on the Judiciary Committee of the Association of the Bar of the City of New York, his membership in the National Black Prosecutors Association and service as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Summit New Jersey Area YMCA. Appointed Executive Director of the Police Athletic League in September of 2014, Mr. Watts oversees one of New York City's oldest and largest non-for-profit services, um, which serves nearly 30,000 underserved city youth in education and youth development programs. And so welcome, Fred Watt. And next we have George Mosey. After 28 years as a prosecutor, George Mosey retired from the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office in December of 2016, where he last served as the first assistant district attorney. George Mosey joined the office in 1988 and served in various units, including motions, major trials, federal alternatives to state trials, as a special assistant U.S. attorney, the asset forfeiture chief, and chief of the dangerous drug offender unit. From 1995 to 2002, he was the deputy district attorney in charge of the narco narcotics division. And in, from 2002 to 2015, George was the deputy district attorney in charge of the juvenile division. On January 2, 2017, George Mosey was appointed the executive director of the Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Violence Network. In 2019, this network celebrated its 30, 30th year anniversary, and more importantly, 30 years of never wavering in its efforts to prevent violence and drug abuse in the city of brotherly love. The fundamental strategy of his organization is best exemplified by the motto, we make house calls. Pam's commitment to outreach is a reflection of its realization that a helping hand must sometimes be attached to an extremely long arm. You may see Pam's vehicles anywhere at any time as its programs operate every day of the week and nearly all day concentrating on the neighborhoods that are hardest hit by violence. Welcome, George Mosey. And finally, we have Rhonda McKitten, who is a Stonely Fellow Youth Policy and Training Specialist of the Philadelphia Police Department and is the Project Director for Philadelphia's Juvenile Assessment Center and Youth Arrest Reform Project. Ms. McKitten is also the Director of the Pennsylvania DMC Youth Law Enforcement Corporation and has trained youth and police across the country as co-developer of the IACP Juvenile Justice Institute. Prior to her Stonely Fellowship, Ms. McKitten served as the Director of Juvenile Grants and Policy and as a Senior Trial Attorney in the Juvenile Unit of the Defender Association of Philadelphia. Ms. McKitten is a member of the Disproportionate Minority Contact DMC Subcommittee of the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency and Philadelphia's MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge Racial and Ethnic Disparities Work Group. So, just to explain to all of you how um, this webinar came about, um, shortly after um, the George Floyd um, murder and with all of the calls for justice, I, I was trying to find what we could do as prosecutors to help bring about solutions. And I reached out to George Mosey, um, who I knew had been one of the key catalysts 
for the DMC Youth Law Enforcement Program in Philadelphia. And during that phone call, George was very clear as to what prosecutors could do. And he, he specifically that day said, we have to work on building relationships between police and youth. So then I decided, well, who else is doing that? And I reached out to Fred Watts of the Police Athletic League because I knew he was doing this work on a daily basis in New York City. And within a day, the idea for this webinar came about. And then shortly thereafter, we um, contacted Rhonda to join us in this presentation. So today, the format will be that each of our speakers are going to share with you um, the work that they are doing on the front lines. And then we are going, we've received a lot of um, questions from the participants. So we are going to do our best to address your questions. And again, if we don't reach um, all of you today, we will be providing, I'm going to provide my email address and Christy Browning, who is another senior attorney, or she's the director at the NDAA, um, we will get back to you if we don't get to your questions today. So again, we have a lot of people participating. And again, thank you all for joining us. Um, the other thing I did want to note is that when we had submitted this um, concept to OJJDP about presenting a webinar on this topic and looking to address this, they um, have been very supportive of, of this project. And actually, uh, we're going to be moving forward and increasing our activities in this specific area. So for those of you who are juvenile court prosecutors or working with juvenile court prosecutors, please stay in touch with us because we really feel like today is really the kickoff of an initiative where we're going to work on really building relationships between youth and law enforcement in those, these communities. So, so Fred, um, we will start with you today. And um, the Police Athletic League has been an institution in New York City with a very simple mission, police officers helping kids, helping communities. And Pal has been working in partnership with the New York City Police Department for many years, keeping thousands of children safe and productive during those high-risk after-school hours. Um, as you and I both know, uh, the Police Athletic League was a very special organization for our former boss, Robert Morgenthau, who served on the board of the Police Athletic League for over 50 years, and once said that PAL could put him out of business. So can you tell the participants today a little bit more about the Police Athletic League um, and the different programs that it's offering to New York City youth? Sure. Well, thank you very much for having me. And it's good to see you again, Susan, and to be with George and Rhonda. Um, I did note on the chat that there are there's a somebody in this audience from Turks and Caicos. I'd like to get their name and address and see if I can get an invitation and maybe in the winter. Um, and I did note a former colleague from the Manhattan DA's office, who I won't mention her name, but I just happened to see that. So it was nice to see her. Uh, Back. But it ain't even a bit about PAL. So, and our name may not really capture what we do. So, if you bear with me, I'll just give you a feel for our history. Um, PAL is actually the oldest police athletic league in the United States, and it started in 1914. So, we're 106 years old. And it started as cops uh, basically taking what were then referred to as and trying to create open spaces where the kids could play. And it was basically a recreation program. Somewhere in the mid-1940s, uh, you know, there's no new thing under the sun. Somewhere in the mid-1940s, uh, New York City Council, they said, why are we paying for the police to do this? The police athletic league should be a nonprofit. Let them go raise money and do these recreational activities and let cops fight the crime. And that's what they did. Um, and so we are an independent nonprofit, and we've been so for 60, 70 years. Uh, my math is not great, but whatever that comes to, I think it's actually closer to 80 years. And um, we're a 501c3. We raise money and so forth. But we do get a large amount of government funding. But our mission is broad. Yes, we work very closely with the police, and one of our central missions is to bring the police and the community together.
today that that to um, for the community to be safe and to be vibrant, you have to have a robust youth development program. So we fancy ourselves really as a youth development pro, uh, organization that uses the police sort of as our special sauce to bring the police and community together. So what does that mean? We, if you think of the age of a child, we start at the age of two. We have um, a, a Head Start program, age, kids ages two to five, come every day, and it's, it's your classic daycare preschool program um, funded largely by the federal government. Um, once you get into kindergarten, you're eligible for our after-school program. And our after-school program, kids literally come straight from school to one of our, in, at, currently we have 20 centers in the five boroughs of New York City. And we have, uh, you do everything from homework assignments to recreational activity to, uh, we have agricultural programs in certain places. It's, it's a very sort of varied program. But again, the focus is the child developing the child. As one gets older, we try to get more involved in leadership activities and, and so forth. And then, of course, you hit your teens, and then we're more involved in competitive sports um, and uh, college prep. So I've been talking for two minutes, haven't mentioned the cop. Where do the cops fit into all this? You're the police athletically. The police, we attempt to intertwine them into everything we do. Because the theory is that if, you, if a kid can meet a cop in a sort of an ordinary circumstance when they're five or they're eight or they're 10, cop reads to them, cop plays ball with them and so forth, that that first encounter with an officer as a casual, friendly encounter can set both parties, both the cops and the kids, on a better path as as things get, um, you know, more complicated as they get older. So we bring cops into our after-school programs. Our cops get in, we have a junior police program where the kid, kid, like third graders are, you know, junior police and they, and they learn a bit about police work. Um, but all this is through youth. We get more targeted as they get older. So by the time you're in your teens, that's when, uh, for example, most of our sports program, the officers either coach the kids or play with, them, or, or, or they're co coaches with the kids. And we do that in a variety of sports. And that, in the video that you'll see shortly, we've also expanded that to targeted activities in music and performing arts, where the cops and the kids interact. And you'll see this in the video. Um, we work with another program called the All-Star, where we, um, cops and kids, and I think it's somewhat similar, to George's organization um, are interacting more directly in kind of a, you know, rap sessions and counter groups sort of where they can learn more about each other, um, and that's for older kids. So throughout our program, but at its core, we're attempting to really just build a better child. And most importantly, when I say build, I don't mean to be condescending. It's in my view, it's very simple. These kids should have the same opportunities that I had when I was a kid, that my kids have, and that your kids have. Many of our kids don't because of either poverty or um, all sorts of racism, all sorts of circumstances that may befall a child. If you can give that child a chance to do well in school, have a good experience, be physically well, go on trips, meet police officers in their neighborhoods and communities so just there's a better chance for success. So that's what we're about and um, that's what we do and we try to draw resources from the police and quite frankly from prosecutors' offices. Because of my experience at the DA's office, um, we very often draw on current or former prosecutors for everything from money um, but also participating with our kids. We're trying to start a moot court competition with kids. We are um, we have uh, mentors, so we really try to work with all of law enforcement. But that's that's who we are and what we're about. That's great, Ted. And you mentioned, so we have a video that gives us um, a bit of an overview of some of the programs you were talking about. 
we have our Cops and Kids course where police officers and students come together to write songs and perform them. This was remarkable. Working with these children, the energy, the bond that we have now, like like these kids, I'm going to be connected to them forever now. I definitely learned a lot from this experience, and working with the police officers and music all together was just totally great. This is a project where um, 26 participants, um, 15 teens and 11 NYPD officers are coming together over the course of eight weeks to write original music. I just am so thankful for this experience and to be able to be hands-on. We wrote a song together, we wrote a melody, it was just amazing. It's such a great experience for anyone to be part of and I'm just so thankful that I was able to do this. Pal has tried to really leverage and expand our interactions with the police and our young people. Over the last year in particular, we've looked for more and better ways to do that. The program is important now, given so much that has been going on in the country, so many things that the young people themselves have been seeing, allow the young people to have an opportunity to see the officers as human beings, not as the enemy. You get to know each other. And what better way to do that than the arts? With the Police Athletic League, it definitely gives us an opportunity to get close to the kids on an outside of the work environment where we can all just be ourselves. It's not something that you can get for free anywhere else in the city. Not like this. They, they literally made it possible for us to go and perform in Carnegie Hall and be surrounded with all this love and positivity and worked with us for weeks on ideas that were in our minds. They were actually like nice, real people. <laughs> I've been working with Nadia a lot, and she is one of the nicest people that I've ever met. And she's very kind, too. And I mean, she kind of acts like a mom. And, you know, I'd never thought I'd get something like that from a police officer. <laughs> City PAL Cops and Kids Chorus. the New York City Cops and Kids Chorus. I see some of these kids now, it reminds me of myself, the way I was when I was in PAO. You know, the same things that I learned in PAO, I carry on in life. It's the last round for the championship, so we're gonna give it our all for the kids. We're playing Harlem. 
no munchie bottle, but they look good. Amazing work, amazing work. Thank you for sharing that, Ted. So now, um, George, we're going to um, switch over to you now. Now, you have spent many, many years as a prosecutor in the Philadelphia DA's office, and you were actually in the DA's office when the Youth Law Enforcement Project was started. So can you explain to the audience the catalyst, you know, what was it that brought about the formation of the, the group? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, back in 2003, a group of stakeholders from juvenile justice in Philadelphia came together and the purpose of that meeting was to try to find ways to improve the relationships between young people and the police. Um, all of us were very, very interested in prevention work. Uh, we recognize, and I recognize as a prosecutor early on, that the very best way to effectuate public safety is through prevention. And in this context, we viewed it as a potential way to prevent young people from being arrested. You know, how many times does a mere encounter evolve into a situation where somebody gets arrested? But it also would prevent officers from being assaulted. Uh, I don't know about your jurisdictions, but in Philadelphia, we lose a, an awful lot of police street time just because officers are out injured on duty. And often those injuries, although they may not be serious, they're enough to keep you out of work because you were in a, a scuffle with somebody who maybe wasn't a suspect in the beginning, but who became somebody that you had to arrest as a result of the encounter going south. So those uh, dual justice stakeholders, including myself, I was with the DA's office, of course, at the time, a representative from the uh, public defender's office, the chief, in fact, a representative from our child welfare group. Um, we had a representative from the school district. We had people who represented just about every entity that could uh, impact the life of a juvenile in our system. Uh, we came together, and we weren't rocket scientists, but we were smart enough to realize that it made sense to bring representatives from the two groups that we were trying to reach. So we had some young people, and we had some police officers, and we put them in a room, and uh, we believed that we were going to engage in exploratory surgery to really dive into the situation, you know, find out what it was that was creating the rift between young people and the police. And then we would develop some strategy to address that. Interesting thing happened. Uh, bringing them into the room, giving them an opportunity to have a discourse um, actually turned out to be part of the solution to the problem. Uh, the ability, to the opportunity to just talk to one another, to see that they weren't so different, to find out that some of the cops came from the neighborhoods that the young people came from, that the young people had similar aspirations to the police. Just that opportunity seemed to repair and improve the relationship between the two groups. So we scrapped any notion of putting together some, you know, a high-minded strategy and decided that what we really needed to do was to facilitate the opportunity for police and young people to come together and interact. Uh, that gave birth to our um, police law enforcement curriculum. And Rhonda McKitten is gonna talk uh, about that in depth, but I can tell you about our experience with facilitating those encounters throughout the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we've done it in rec centers, in churches, in schools at both the high school and middle school level. Uh, we've done it in some of our juvenile justice institutions in close proximity to Philadelphia. We've done it in community-based programs in Philadelphia. But um, I guess we're, we're most proud of the opportunity that the city of Philadelphia has given us to do our forums, our trainings, in the police academy. That means that every officer 
who would exercise arrest power in the city of Philadelphia experiences this opportunity to interact with young people in a facilitated, organized kind of way before they hit the streets. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, even what it is that we do isn't necessarily rocket science. Um, Rhonda McKitten, she will tell you about uh, the formal presentations that she does to bo for both young people and law enforcement, but I, I simply facilitate and other facilitators bring a panel of law enforcement and young people to the stage in the room that's filled with all of the recruits and we, we talk about the issues that are relevant to the problems with the relationship. We talk about the issues that can help to reform and rehabilitate the relationship. Uh, one of my favorite questions is for the panel and the audience to talk about stereotypes. And invariably, in discussing stereotypical views of young people, somebody says they're disrespectful. And you can imagine that opens a whole can of worms in terms of, you know, what it is that we talk about. Um, when we talk about stereotypes related to the police, I, I like to ask, what is the stereotypical view of the favorite meal for police officers? And, of course, uh, several people shout out together, uh, donuts. But then that <laughs> takes us into a discussion of why it is that police officers eat donuts. And, you know, some, some pretty uh, practical answers come out of that discussion. You know, the fact is that uh, the Dunkin' Donuts is open 24-7. And if they're working last out, they need a place to get some coffee and donuts. And the other thing is that uh, the proprietor of that donut shop or coffee stand is always happy to see the police come and uh, take advantage of their services because that means they're getting some extra protection. Uh, free of charge while that officer is on the scene. Um, that discussion of stereotypes uh, necessarily brings to bear the questions related to race relations. And so I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that uh, a lot of our effort flows from the fact that there's disproportionality in the number of young people of color who are arrested. And this uh, entire initiative certainly was grounded in our desire to address that specifically. But in the end, it's a human problem. And so uh, this program that we've developed and that we've nurtured, and, and I'm happy to say we've been able to train every incoming class of recruits uh, who will, as I said, exercise arrest powers in the city of Philadelphia since 2009. And so at this point, I think it be good to see our video. Yep. So now we're going to William. Can you? I video? was approached by one of the young folks who was in detention, and he walks up to me and he says, "I hate all cops." I was nervous. I thought they were going to be mean to us. I was terrified. I thought they were going to be like, you know, really. Because the cops from around here, is, that's how they act. I ain't want to go, because I don't like cops. I like them, but not that much. They had killed my uncle. And like from there, like my family don't like cops, because what they did. So. You know, there's a such thing as bad cops, but there's a such thing as good cops as well. Yeah, but. <sighs> it's the truth. It's the truth. <laughs> I said, well, that's the reason why I'm here. I said, because what I want to do is to convince you that you don't have to hate all cops. We had no idea what the event was going to be at all except for interacting with juveniles. You can't know what to expect until you get there. What you see is apprehension at the beginning of the day. I've never seen that many cops like in one room. I don't know how many cops are. I would estimate like 200 cops. It's a very, very intimidating place to be.
have a lot of new recruits that are going to be out there in the street of Philadelphia. They're young. We have young people coming in who have some, let's say, stereotyped opinions about law enforcement. Well, I'm kind of excited about today. I'm very passionate about young people and helping them grow into manhood. All right, I first walk in, bang, you see cops, everything. Like cops walking by, you see the police car on the side, the old handcuffs and everything. Looking around, I'm like, oh man. <laughs> Everybody thought it would just be like, oh, we're just probably gonna sit around, hear people talk, grow boring. If we can get those two groups together, the new law enforcement officers and the young people, and get them to understand each other, that alone is gonna reduce negative contact. <laughs> There are too many minority youth who are having negative contact with police, and because of that negative contact, they're getting locked up. And you know and I know once they're locked up, that's the slippery road. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody know why you're here today other than being dragged out of your bed? Really, honestly, do you know why you're here today? You're going to be together with police officers, and you're going to be able to give them what you feel. For some of these kids, it's the very first time that they have ever had an opportunity to sit down with a police officer outside of the kind of interactions that they have on the street corners. How I many of you all know somebody that's been, uh, been stopped by the police? That's almost everybody, right? How many of you know somebody that's in jail? Today, everybody respecting everybody. Because this is my shout. I'm the director. So you will get your words in today, because I'm the facilitator. It's my show. We're going to spend the day together. What you say in this room stays in this room. We want you to tell law enforcement what your experience is all about. They want to know. We want you to have an honest conversation with law enforcement. On the panel, you're going to have law enforcement folk and young people and a facilitator. They sit um, beside each other. And it's kind of every other person, so it's an officer and then a young person. Cop, kid, cop, kid. Anything that you say will not be used against you in the world law. You have a perfect opportunity to express yourself freely and completely. This is a two-way conversation. This is not about coming here to listen to adults. This is about adults coming here to listen to what you have to say. But today, we want you to teach us something new. We hear a lot about stereotypes. What is the definition of a stereotype? Stereotype is like a rumor. Like when people say every black person eats fried chicken. That's not true. <laughs> stereotype goes two ways. A lot of times officers are stereotyped and it is assumed that because I'm an officer that I'm a certain way. Don't stereotype me. We've been very, uh, really I'll just say that we're blessed to have George Mosey uh, as a key facilitator here in Philadelphia. I need open, honest, and free-flowing communication. I do believe that the facilitator needs to have some law enforcement credibility because it helps uh, for the law enforcement people to feel that they're not being set up in this. They can talk about anything and they can even accuse police officers if they want to and the police likewise can say whatever's on their minds. When somebody that you know kills somebody that you know and you don't say that's a problem. Like if I talk to the cops, they might like, shoot me and talk to the young. I'm not scared. I know what's I know what's right. I know what's wrong. If he has to keep his mouth shut to protect his family, he is doing the right thing. It becomes a very powerful conversation. You are not supposed to care about what other people think about you. It is what you think about yourself. They're gonna judge you real quick. They're gonna think that you automatically are always in trouble or doing something wrong with the law. And police officers think they can just do whatever they want because they think I do not know my rights. I mean, there was a lot of honesty that was going on and kids could have probably been locked up right there for some of the things that they admitted to. What are some of the stereotypes young people have about police officers? All police officers eat donuts and drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> 
there was one police officer, um, I believe his name was Paris. You know there are bad cops out there. And you know there are bad asses of you out there. And you know it is a fire, but it ain't everybody. It's what the world really is. He made a, a, a huge impression on me as well as my kids. I was like, damn. I'm going home every night the same way I left. <laughs> okay? And yeah. there is nobody more important on that scene than me. <laughs> Number one is me. <laughs> it wasn't what I expected. Like, I thought it was going to be something corny like that, like something that really wasn't going to have no type of meaning or something I wouldn't remember. Well, I'm going to flip the script now. And I'm going to give some people who were stopped by the police who aren't police an opportunity to show the police how it should be done. Okay, officers Ryan and Avery, come on down. This is the stoop in front of Miss Johnson's house. And Miss Johnson is sick and tired of these two juvenile delinquents sitting on her stoop every night. So she calls the 25th police district. <laughs> Yeah, the, the role play was, was the best thing. It was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> the role play. Now don't make me call the chief on me. I want these people out front of my property. I ain't gonna go out there and do it because I'm scared. <laughs> but, <laughs> you police officer. The kids were trying to act like they're the cops and the adults were acting like, you know, the juveniles do. Like, why should I have to get off my step? I talked to him. Oh, Jimmy. We we'll need you to call him back. I think they were realizing how much resistance they actually get back. And it, to the kids, I think they realized it didn't feel good. I'm just doing my job. I'm not doing my job. Do your job and get back in the heat. Get your wife, people. I ain't doing nothing. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, may I see your ID, please? What are you doing? I'm loading. Why do you want that? What do I do? I didn't do nothing. I didn't do nothing. Now you want me to go? You make me go. Oh, man. Jesus. And he was a little upset because, you know, we lost our little cousin, you know, you know. So now the young people get to see what it really feels like to be a police officer. Hey, what's, what's my name? Why are you asking? What's my name? You don't even know my name. Why are you asking my girl? Hey, hey, you know. <laughs> that's my cousin. You just said that's my name. What else? <laughs> <laughs> that's my it's my name. not your stupid. though. It's not your stupid. But it's not your stupid. But it's not your stupid. We're not talking to you. We're talking to you right now. Alright, we're talking to you, man. Yo, how long you been a cop, dude? <laughs> cuz? Cuz, what's cuz? You, you got a fucking attitude? You got an attitude? I'll you show you. You look attitude. like you're gonna show me an attitude? Hey, look, officer, I'm not gonna speak on behalf of them, but I'm gonna go because I don't want no problems, alright? So I'm gonna go. Thing. I'm gonna go. That's the best thing I heard. Pansy! You know, in the street, when something happens, Okay, um, so for those of you, I know that we had experienced some technical problems there and the screen froze for many of you, and I'm sorry about that because that video is honestly um, just amazing. So we will try to get that back out to everybody, um, send a link out. But in terms of moving forward, Rhonda, I'd like to ask you a few questions now because I know that you're working you continue to bring this program um, to communities all over, and you've been working outside of Philadelphia as well. So can you tell the audience more about what you're actually doing with this program now and the different groups that you're bringing? Absolutely. And um, my video was also frozen, so I'm not sure how much of it folks were able to see. I think it gives a really good view, though, of what the panel discussions look like between officers and young people, what the small groups are like. Um, and that's where we started in 2003. So out of those conversations, what we heard over and over again from officers, not only that the conversations help them understand each other from a different perspective 
and to find commonalities and develop relationships. But also, we were hearing from both young people and officers that they felt that there wasn't enough training for officers explaining what they need to know about how youth are different, how to work with young people. Um, a lot of the things that we now know about adolescent brain development, the effect of trauma on the way that young people have to respond to authority, those are areas where nationally there's very little training for law enforcement. Um, about 3% of police training nationally is dedicated to juvenile issues, and almost all of that um, in most jurisdictions is really related to more of the legal requirements related to um, interacting with and arresting young people, like the six-hour rule, that sort of thing. Um, as opposed to giving officers the tools that they need to have positive interactions with young people. So we work to build a curriculum that integrates the panel discussions because really kind of the heart of everything is the interactions between young people and officers and their ability to talk about their own concerns and the things that are happening at that moment. Um, but then to follow that up, with um, training for officers on adolescent brain development um, and youth trauma, but through the lens of um, what kinds of behaviors officers might see from young people, situations that might be difficult to navigate or frustrating, and understanding how what we know now about neurological changes during the teenage and early adulthood of people um, how trauma can affect those, but more importantly, giving officers tools to de-escalate those situations and have better interactions. Also do, at that same time, training for young people, helping them to look at things from different perspectives, doing um, trainings on how to have safe stops and interactions, answering questions for the young people. Um, and then we come together and we do role plays, which is really one of my favorite parts of the day, letting them kind of bring it all together. Um, we realized um, pretty early on that this is a kind of conversation that would be valuable almost anywhere. And we have been able to replicate the program in seven counties in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania State Police have integrated the curriculum into their cadet training. Um, we've also spread the program in three jurisdictions in Connecticut, in Memphis, Tennessee, and have done training in New York. The way we were able to do that originally was through the Pennsylvania um, Commission on Crime and Delinquency, which provides support that continues even now for us to help jurisdictions in Pennsylvania with their trainings. Um, but outside of Pennsylvania um, and within Pennsylvania, we found that there are different needs. Um, Ideally, what we like to do is work with stakeholders. I think this is one place where the role of prosecutors can be really important because prosecutors have convening power and often have relationships with a lot of different stakeholders in the justice system, and they can bring people together to keep a program like this going and to train facilitators so that it can be used on an ongoing basis to work with young people and officers. Um, and that's how we've done most of our work in other jurisdictions, by training facilitators who are local, mentoring them so that they can learn to teach the program on their own, and then coming back periodically if there are questions or issues that arise. The, um, we also have realized, though, that in small jurisdictions, there may not be enough people available to become full-time trainers, people leave jobs, that can be really difficult. So we've been able to have teams of trainers who will come out and teach the program, um, facilitate the panel discussion, teach the modules on adolescent development. But at the core of everything is really the interaction between the young people and the officers who live um, in that neighborhood, in that community, and the concerns that they have as opposed to someone from outside coming and um, giving our view about what we think they might be interested in or concerned about. And the entire day really builds off that.
That's amazing. And I, and I think, you know, that whole idea of finding similarities, um, and even for the officers, I mean, we've all been adolescents. We all know what it's like to be an adolescent. And, you know, you talked about training law enforcement about what we've learned about adolescent development. And, you know, that always brings me back to the fact that we've known that kids are different for a very long time. We've had a juvenile system since 1899. And I think what the science now has shown us is that kids are not hardwired, really, until they're mid to late 20s. So we have such an opportunity with young people to build positive relationships. And we know that very often one of the most important factors for a young person is a positive adult in their life. So I think what we're seeing in these programs is the opportunity for those within the community to come together and serve as mentors, including those within the police department. So, um, so I, I thank you all for your presentations. And again, we apologize for the technical problems, but um, we're going to start trying to answer some of the many questions that have been sent in. Um, and I'll start off with um, one that we got today, this afternoon. Um, so Fred, we'll start with you. How could one begin building amazing programs like this in their smaller jurisdiction? So what, what advice would you give to a small jurisdiction to get the ball rolling with either a program like um, the Police Athletic League or with what George and Rhonda are doing to get the community involved? Right. I, well, I one of the things that um, I think is true both in large jurisdictions like New York and small jurisdictions is that the police we put so much on the police, and now we're telling them they're involved in the community. And so then, uh, you know, whether it's police commissioner or police chief says, okay, so now I've got to do, you know, run a basketball league. I've got to create a, you know, weekend retreat with teams. And I, I, my advice would strongly be not to do that, but to work with somebody who can do that. So I think the police athletic league, works and, and sometimes doesn't work as well as it should, but works when we hire the coaches, we create a basketball league, we create a music program, and this call and ask for as little of the police as possible so that the so that we can bring the police and the community to everything. Because the outcome will be the same. The community will see the police involved in whatever the activity they're engaged in, but you need, they need help. And someone, it was sort of an aha moment for me. One of the staff members, we were talking about the police's role in the community, and the staff member said to me, this is the way I see it, Fred. There are three circles. Circle number one is, um, is the community. And there they sit, you know, not literally, but sort of figuratively. Circle number two are the police. And they don't always get along so well. But circle number three is people. And we're the place where circle one and two can come together and kind of work it out. And I think the police need that other circle. And, um, and they don't always want it. In New York City, you know, they'd much rather, quite frankly, some of them would rather run their own run their own league. Why do I need you? You know, um, but in the end, if you can, you know, we are the ones that have social workers and gymnasiums and psychologists and teachers. The cops just need to be cops. Show up with an open mind and we'll provide that third circle where you can start to work through it. So to me, that's a large jurisdiction. I think it would also be in a small jurisdiction. You know, you got somebody that, you know, my mother used to love music, you know, so my mother wants to volunteer playing music. She goes to the local community center, and then they call up the cops and say, would you just send a cop over? We've got this little program together. And all of a sudden, you've got a police community, even though really it was set up by the lady who liked the music in the community center who had a, has a piano. So that would be my advice. Let you play to people's strengths and expertise and then invite the officers in as opposed to put, putting on the officers the obligation to do it all. Yes, thanks. George? Well, I, I think um, 
we should emphasize that we've developed um, an entity to actually help other jurisdictions. That was Rhonda's point about what it is that we've been able to do in other states, other counties within Pennsylvania. Uh, we created our own nonprofit corporation that I, I, I'm currently the president, and Rhonda is the director. Uh, and the purpose of that corporation is to extend to others the opportunity to develop training opportunities like we've developed in uh, Philadelphia and other counties in Pennsylvania. Um, one of the things that um, I learned early on, and it's pretty much consistent with what Fred was saying, that you have to know who it is that you're dealing with, even at the planning stage, and whether or not it's going to be fruitful ultimately, and whether or not you're going to be able to develop and implement a program as a result of everything that you invest in the planning stage. Uh, I would strongly recommend that when you go about the business of trying to start a program like this, even if you bring in our corporation as the consultant to help you, that you have decision makers at the table, that you have all of the stakeholders represented, that you have people who are going to be able to decide there and then that this is something that we want to do. Because if you have to run it up the flagpole and, and uh, you know, get approval later on down the road, it's probably going to languish and and never actually come into existence. Um, just a small piece, but uh, the bottom line of what I'm suggesting is that you can reach out to us, and Rhonda McKitten will bring a you know a, a small army to your yeah. county or to your to your state, and uh, we'll help you create. Okay. And I think what one of the things that Fred just mentioned, which is important, is um, you know not putting this on the police. And I think George, you had mentioned early on the importance of you know you you and Bob served as facilitators, so the police were really participants along with the youth. So that's really important as well. Um, and getting the community because I think that that's. Again, one of the silver linings to everything that's going on right now is that communities want to address these problems, and if we're coming forward with solutions, I think that the, the time right now is that communities are going to want to work together on this. And Rhonda, I'm sorry, did you have something to share for that? No, I think George covered it perfectly. Okay. And. Um, Another question we have is how can we work with schools and school staff to help bridge this gap? Um, are you guys working with um, different schools or, or different school organizations? Um, Fred, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, we work closely with schools. Half of our centers are essentially co-located in public schools. so. All of our after-school programs and some of our even team activities happen in the school where the principal is, you know, we're working closely with the principal. So we're working closely with them on everything from kids got homework in math, I want your after-school program to focus on math. We do things like that. But also the, the, the outreach and the parent engagement, there's, a you know, a lot in, um, I shouldn't say schools today, probably always was the case, that, that, that the success of the school is often determined by how engaged the parent is in the student's life. So parent engagement is a big part of after school. The point being, when we do both parent engagement and after school programs, we work closely with the school. And when we introduce the police element, we're doing that certainly with the interaction with the school. So in our case, the way we function, the school can be vital to sort of carrying on, not only through the child, but through the child's parents, that um, uh, we want that part of what we're doing is not only educating their child, but trying to develop the child in a better relationship with the, uh, with the, with the police and the community. Great. George? So, you know, I think, um, Involving the schools is extremely important. We try to make sure that this is a, an even-handed approach and that we reach um, just as many young people as we reach police officers. Certainly the academy is a place where the emphasis is on the recruits, although the presentation tries to be even-handed. Um, to use the schools 
allows us to reach, uh, obviously, a lot more young people. So um, we, we have somebody who is uh, intimately involved with the schools on our steering committee. Um, she has actually uh, made inroads with the school district on our behalf. Uh, she originally facilitated our um, early um, meetings in the schools, high schools, middle schools, and that sort of blossomed into an ongoing consistent relationship with the schools. Uh, very important to have somebody uh, on your steering committee who has that kind of access, who knows the nomenclature, who knows the, the people who are in power so that you can get into the building. Uh, but I, I certainly agree that the schools are very, very important uh, to this initiative and to juvenile justice in general. Absolutely. Rhonda? So I think schools are a really important partner for the work that we do, both in the way that George described and also when I think about it more broadly, when we work with other communities, um, everyone has kind of a different inroad that opens up the conversation and brings people to the table. Um, in some jurisdictions, it's juvenile probation that convenes the conversation. In some, it's law enforcement, sometimes prosecutors, sometimes community organizations. But schools can really be a, a powerful convening force. And I think that because educators have such an making sure that their students um, have a positive relationship with police, understand um, what it is that police do, and it ties in so nicely with a lot of civics education, um, that schools can be really powerful partners to help bring others to the table if someone's trying to get a program started that they might not otherwise be able to. Um, in addition, kind of thinking more broadly, conversation. And I um, a role as helping to lift up the voices of young people in conversations about, um, you know, changes to policing, police reform, what's important to communities, and. Um, bringing schools into the conversation can, ha can help large groups of young people really share with police leadership the things that are important to them, the experiences they have, and just the experience for young people of having law enforcement listen to them respectfully um, and for them to be listening to law enforcement um, is, I think, a really powerful one for students. That's great, thank you. Um, another question that was submitted, how can prosecutors actually work directly with youth in their communities as well? Are there any um, programs that you know about or you have worked in? Um, I know with the work that we have done with the juvenile justice work at the NDAA is um, prosecutors do a lot in terms of prevention and I know that um, preventing um, substance use issues and things like that. Um, and I know that there's a lot of diversion programs out there. Um, so Fred, do you want to start, do you know of any programs where prosecutors are directly involved in the community work? So um, um, I'll do my best to answer this, but I, I, do, I do want to make a point here. The, so um, Cal, for example, has a juvenile, what we call a juvenile justice program where we focus on kids who are court involved. Typically they're arrested at the age of 15, 16, often for a relatively minor crime. And a condition of their probation is to our programs. Uh, it's been very successful, small numbers, a couple of hundred kids, uh, but it's been very successful and the recidivism rate of the kid in the program is dramatically lower than the typical recidivism rate. And I think that all law enforcement, I, know, I noticed the question about probation officers, I think prosecutors could be vital in this, police officers, is engaging kids, especially those kids in, that have been involved in the juvenile justice system, 
of what went wrong, how we're going to make sure it doesn't happen again, um, I think can be very vital. I'm sure we're not the only people who do that, and I'm sure there are many other organizations that do. Um, but I, uh, I, I do see that as a, a, a role. I also see involvement in, you know, I remember, one, you know, back, geez, this is uh, before when you were in college, Susan, um, uh, Mr. Morton teamed up with a brand new education program in, in New York City, still exists today, called Legal Outreach. And as a result, he sent uh, young assistants, myself being one of them, to, to basically uh, coach moot court in high school. So I guess the, my point, and we also did presentations, but the point being, I think prosecutors getting into schools and interacting with kids in maybe somewhat different ways, but similar to what we were talking about with cops, I think can be very valuable for kids to see beyond what they imagined that maybe they could do. And so I do think anything that you can do to get prosecutors into schools, and it doesn't have to be street law or some conversation about their constitutional rights. I, I, I think that's too narrow. I just think that if, if you're a 26-year-old assistant DA who grew up in the neighborhood where you're now you know, working, you, you get in the school and let some kid who never thought he could be you meet you, see that you seem pretty content, and, and maybe learn about the things they can do to become you. So th that, that would be my um, strong advice. I just think you know, what's the 90% of genius is showing up? I just think prosecutors that the people that are making these decisions care and tells the kids, gee, maybe I don't want to be him or her, but I want to be something like her, and maybe I can learn about how to get there. Absolutely. And I'm actually reminded there's a program um, that was started by a prosecutor up in Boston where the prosecutor and um, a police chief go into the elementary schools and they just go in and read books. And it is that whole idea of building a relationship, showing very early on that, you know, we're people just like you and, and really kind of building those relationships at a very young age. So I think that's a great point to make. And George, um, what, because I know you did a lot of work um, with prosecutors working directly on juvenile justice issues. Yeah, well, I, I know that there are a lot of prosecutors who are participating in this webinar right now who are, want me to address the question of when are they going to find the time to do it. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's a difficult life for prosecutors, for defenders. Um, when are you going to find time to do it? Not, so I think it's, it's very, very important for management to uh, actually carve out time and to provide opportunities for prosecutors to engage in community relations, to work with young people, to, in effect, um, do community prosecution. You know, all the things that Fred said are absolutely uh, necessary. They're impactful but it's not gonna happen unless management adopts a perspective that understands the importance of allowing prosecutors from the office to have the time to do those things. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's one of the things that we do in the training because there are a lot of juvenile prosecutors who are attending today's training. And, you know, unfortunately, in a lot of prosecutors' offices across the country, the juvenile prosecutors just look you know, as a starting point in the office, and this is where we're going to put somebody to learn, get some trial experience. And, you know, one of the things we've tried to emphasize through the National DA's Association is just how important the role of the juvenile prosecutor is and how important it is to have dedicated and experienced um, attorneys in those positions, but also the whole idea that this prevention work, this community work is really very so it's so important to public safety so that's one of the messages getting that over to the elected DAs who are making these staffing decisions and making um, the decisions on what the priorities will be in their office 
And Rhonda, I'm sorry, did you, I didn't mean to, did you have something to say on that? I would just add that I think one of the really important things about having um, particularly if you're working with young people who are actively in the justice system, um, is that they have the ability to, you know, basically grant immunity for what's said during those conversations. And, you know, I know some people had trouble seeing the video, but um, if you were able to see it, one of the first things you heard was George in front of an entire room saying anything you say today will not be used against you. Um, and that is a really powerful thing for not just young people, but for officers to hear that they can speak openly um, without having ramifications later on and to hear that from their own leadership. So that is, I think, in addition to all the role modeling and making sure that there's the ability for people to, um, you know, to break out to do the work, um, the, when it's possible for prosecutors to give that kind of assurance, it really helps people open up and have a trusting relationship. Right, absolutely. And, and I mean, that's something that we talk about, you know, having honest conversations and if we want to encourage you to be honest and open. Um, and George, I think that's actually something we had talked about that came up while we're talking about statements that are made either in diversion programs or during screening and assessments. And there's been a lot of prosecutors and, and even legislators moving forward with rules or um, entering into MOUs where we agree that if we're going to talk to a youth through screening or um, an assessment, because we really want to get to the truth that we wouldn't use those statements against the youth. So again, all of these are just trying to move forth um, to build the relationships. And I'm, since I just mentioned you, George, is there anything you wanted to say about that with regard to statements made by youth? You know, it's interesting when you're talking about juvenile justice in Pennsylvania, uh, the predominant philosophy is to actually uh, help the young person. Uh, there's nothing punitive about it. it it's the design is to rehabilitate. Um, and if that is the, uh, the goal of everyone, um, you can't do it unless you can um, believe that you have all the information necessary to put together the right plan of action. You can't do that without doing assessments. And you can't do it pre-trial without some ability to have a conversation with the defendant before trial. And so we've uh, developed a number of programs in Philadelphia. Uh, I've worked with Rhonda and, and uh, her former boss, Bob Listenby, who actually now is the first assistant in the DA's office. I talk about culture shock. Um, but we, we hammered out agreements and MOUs that allowed us to have access to the information that we all needed to be effective in helping the young person to uh, become a viable member of society. So I think it's very important, a very important consideration. Great, thank you. Um, another question that we had, and this actually came in from several different people, but um, what advice would you give to prosecutors who are reticent to maybe upset officers by calling out um, bad behavior? Wait, hold on. Um, uh, or, you know, having honest conversations with police um, because sometimes they, they just feel uncomfortable. So, um, Fred, would you like to start us off with that, answering that question? I'll take a stab at it from my old life, and I'll say that, and again, I'm, you know, I'm used to working in a large city, but I do not think it's the individual assistant DA's responsibility to square off with an individual officer and his bad behavior or her bad behavior, um, that's too much to ask. I think it is your officers and the institution's responsibility to hold the officers to account. So you can't walk out there and by yourself, you're trying to handle a case, you think the officer, I, I just feel like that's too much to take on. But you have to have an office behind you and with you 
that when you have that happen, you can then discuss how we as an office are going to address it. And I don't think an office does itself no good by currying favor with the police. You've got to call it as you see it, but it has to be the office has to call it as it sees it. And quite frankly, you're, you know, in New York, it's an elected official. The elected official has to have the guts to piss off the commission and do the right thing. So to me, it comes down to courage and process and office. And I think that's what's called for. I also think in terms of practices, my experience in the Manhattan DA's office, is and and I, I was stunned to see you know some of these popular not popular, some of these well reported cases of police abuse around the country where the DA just makes a decision and signs a letter and submits it to somebody I don't think that should ever happen in New York all police certainly police shootings police deaths serious police misconduct all goes to the grand jury involve the community through the grand jury process. If the officer does something wrong, no matter what it, the superiors are going to be, you have to follow through. But I think for purposes of the people on this call, since I'm sure most of you are not the, well, maybe some of you are, the elected or the appointed uh, prosecutor for a jurisdiction, um, you've got to have an institution behind you that squares off against the police and that institution. Um, the individual saying, gee, officer, I'm not sure you should have, you know, roughed them up that way. I, I just think that puts you in an untenable, as the individual assistant assigned to a case, untenable position. So if you're not in an office like that, that is going to stand behind this, that's, <laughs> I don't know how to talk about that. But to me, it's about an institution and about a process that will involve the public. And, you know, people can say what they will about the grand jury. I've been in enough runaway grand juries to know the public will speak if you put, give a fair presentation of the evidence. And I think that's where the police should be. Um, there should be a process by which they are held to account in a forum that involves the public. And it should be your office behind you, not you individually disciplining individual um, officers. That's the way I feel about it. Okay, thank you, sir. George? So in, in the context of the youth law enforcement forums, um, I'll ask the officers on the panel how they feel about working with an officer who doesn't do the job right. You know, what's it like to work with a bad cop? Uh, what approach do you take to confronting that? And, you know, invariably they'll talk about how working with a bad cop makes life more dangerous for them. They're not going to have community support. Uh, the things that that officer does that often rub people the wrong way actually endanger them while they're on the street. Not only that, it jeopardizes their career because if he goes down, it's likely that uh, his partner is going to go down too. Um, so in that context, uh, I don't confront police officers. I allow police officers to shed light on the fact that, you know, there isn't always this uh, blue wall where they all come together, you know, hell or high water, no matter what was done. They express honestly that they don't want to be with a cop who's doing it the wrong way, that when they put their badge and uniform on every morning, they go out to actually serve the community, not to abuse the community or commit crimes. Um, that's precisely what, what they're there to try to stop. Um, and, and I think that it turns out to be pretty effective. Certainly the young people chime in, um, people from the community chime in, and it, it, it can be a, a hard scenario, but it's an honest scenario. And, and I think the way that we do it avoids what Fred is talking about, you know, um, actually trying to prosecute an officer for something when, there hasn't been an indictment. Great. And Rhonda, did you want to comment? I don't think I have anything additional. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, and there's been a number of questions about um, resources for best practices on this or 
funding opportunities. And I know that since each of you are involved with nonprofit, or all of you are involved in nonprofits, do you have any advice to any um, prosecutors or juvenile justice stakeholders who are trying to do something like this in their community? How can they help raise money for such a project or help get funding for it? Um, Fred, any advice? Well, one, uh, one thought I have, um, it, well, two thoughts. One is the federal government does invest in individual communities. Um, we haven't had tremendous success there, but um, it is a place to look. But that will piggyback onto my second point, and which is, uh, and it sounds a little self-serving, but I think it is true, that um, government entities by themselves, it, it, certainly the New York City government, you know, they, they're going to fund the, the prosecutor's office as a government agency. But if you're going to other funding opportunities, whether it's the federal government, maybe even a foundation, or um, you, it would do the, the, the government prosecutor's office well to partner with a nonprofit or PAL or any host of other organizations because the partnership of public and private, I think first, I think it's sort of kind of a little bit of the flavor of the day of late, but it also makes sense based on everything that we've been talking about that you can leverage your government, your government expertise with the nonprofit's government expertise and the funders often might view that as more attractive. So to me, um, it is, I would focus on uh, partnerships with entities that could, that, that, would, that would present to a funder something more attractive than just, I'm the local DA in my jurisdiction and I would love to be involved more in the community. If you get that same request, you plus George, plus the local CVS drugstore who's going to create 10 internships for the people who go through Georgia's program. Now you've got something that's, to me, more attractive, either in the federal government and maybe even private funders as well. So that would be my advice, collaboration, partnership. Thanks. George? Yeah, and I know Rhonda will really dive into this, uh, but I would like to preface what I know she's going to say with um, the fact that this isn't a, an expensive proposition. It really doesn't cost a tremendous amount of money to put together the forums um, to keep it going. Um, the video, if you're able to see it, talks about the most important or one of the most important times of the day being the lunch hour. And so you got to get money for food so that they can break bread and then have that, uh, that casual, friendly encounter that Fred was talking about earlier. But other than that, uh, you know, and, and making sure that you, you have a staff, uh, that you have people who can do the logistical work, uh, you can have people who can do the outreach, um, it isn't that expensive a proposition. I'll pass it on to Rhonda. I would agree with that. And also, uh, when you're thinking about law enforcement um, and prosecutors, there, um, there's often funding that comes through state SAGs um, and the federal government um, specifically for um, the core areas of the JJDPA, one of which is disproportionate minority contact. So programs that are working to improve relationships and reduce um, disproportionate arrest of youth of color um, fall into that category. Um, and also there, um, there are often funding sources available for police training um, and police, other police programs that if you are working with a nonprofit or even an agency that's law enforcement, having a partnership with your police department and helping to bring the resources to them, um, they often will have access to some funding streams um, but it's true after um, in most jurisdictions that we've worked with, the folks who are actually teaching the program and facilitating the conversation either do it because they are, um, they are given time to participate in the program by their employer 
um, but a lot also just volunteer. And um, so it doesn't need to be a particularly expensive um, program. And also then doing things like partnering with the faith-based community can be a really powerful avenue to um, find in-kind resources. So it really depends on where you are, but I think there's a lot of support available for this kind of thing. Absolutely. And I think especially, you know, with everything that's going on now, um, at the community level, reaching out to those different members and saying, you know what, let's really work together and, and just how we feel about our youth in our communities. And I think that especially working with kids, we're going to find, you're going to, like you just mentioned, Rhonda, volunteers. There, there's so much um, good within our communities and, and looking find these solutions. Um, and I know we're, we're sort of at the end of our time together, but this has really just been an amazing, what I'm hoping is a kickoff to um, a new initiative where we're really going to be focusing a lot more attention on building relationships between youth and the police in their communities. Um, I want to thank our three presenters. I, I really... Um, you're, you really are walking the walk right now, and you're doing the work that is going to make the youth safer, the police safer, and our community safer. Um, I, I want to thank you all. I also want to let everyone know I'll put in my email address here. Um, again, we're sorry about the audio problems, um, but we will be continuing with more trainings on this topic, hopefully more webinars, hopefully more in-person trainings, and maybe Fred and George and Rhonda can join us all in person for a training, um, but I'm going to put my email address in here for any of you prosecutors that want to um, stay in touch. And I don't know, Fred or George or Rhonda, if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to make. Um, I, I actually I have two quick thoughts that I, I just would love to share. One is I recently went to a community meeting after George Floyd's death. Um, and just to make it very brief, uh, you would ex it was held by the NYPD and it invited community leaders, and it was in a very poor neighborhood, uh, exclusively minority, all people of color. And uh, it, the, I was surprised at how positive the attendees were about the NYPD. And I just wouldn't lose sight of the fact that as we watch all of these awful, awful um, events unfold before our eyes on video today, I would that that uh, the conversation about eliminate the police, defund the police, it, it, it's a valid challenge. But at the end of the day, my experience has been that communities want the police. They're actually pleased with some of what they're doing, but they desperately need this awful part to be addressed and corrected. So I just wouldn't want us to lose sight of the fact, and I'm not a police apologist, but I just, you sit in this meeting in the South Bronx, and you hear these, these people talk about, I like my neighborhood coordination officer, I like my commanding officer, and I want him to do more. Um, it reminds you that the communities want and need law enforcement, and they just they want that relationship. And the reason why that that meeting, which could have been a disaster, the reason why it went so well is because it wasn't the first time they had met. These people have been, you know, that that relationship had been growing for some time. And so I would just be mindful of that. Um, and one last very quick thing, and this is more my youth development perspective as opposed to law enforcement. I think when law enforcement goes into communities and interacts, I think I, we all talk about preventing crime, and, and it's completely right. In every grant we've written, we talk about preventing crime. But the fact is, when my kids go to a community program, I, their parents aren't sending them there to prevent crime. They're sending them there to develop as good young people. So I would just, my, my advice to law enforcement, remember that your participation is just helping the kids. Don't worry about, you're not trying to, I mean, yes, you are, you know, big picture, 
But your mindset should be when you put your arm around that kid, it's because he's a kid and he's a value and you can help. And I would just, I would want my mind, the, the, the vibe to the kid can't be, I'm here to make sure you don't commit a crime. Because I've got two sons. I don't want people talking to them that way. I want them talking to them as, hey, you look like you've got some potential. I'm going to help you achieve it. So those are my two hobby horses. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you, Fred. And George? Uh, I'll be very brief. I would just challenge all of the prosecutors who tuned in to think about any case that you've handled, uh, in fact, any scenario in life where conflict seemed to abound, uh, where relationship building wouldn't have helped to prevent that from happening. Um, if you consider that, then consider developing a program like the one that we presented to you today because it's all about relationship building. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And Rhonda? I think I will do what I do best and let George speak for me because he does it well. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. And to all the participants, thank you so much. Please keep in touch with us. And we're going to share the um, links to the videos as well. And um, William, I guess I hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, William, for helping us coordinate this. Yes, thank you, Susan. And again, to our audience, apologies for any of the technical difficulties that you may have experienced due to uh, weather and some bandwidth uh, that's occurring within Adobe. But nonetheless, we have recorded this webinar, and we um, will have it available for folks. We also have the contact information of all of our presenters in the bios document that you all will see uh, here in the handouts as well, where you can reach each of our presenters, uh, and they have their information on that document there as well. Uh, but before we do wrap up, I do just have some last-minute uh, brief, quick housekeeping items that I wanted to uh, bring to everyone's attention um, as we are closing out today. Uh, for individuals who are looking to get in contact with OJJDP's Intech, you may do so by contact us, contacting us at the information that is here on this slide. Oh, the slides are lagging just a little bit here. Let me make sure that they're loading okay. Um, <laughs> taking a little time to load here. Sorry. All right, here we go. Looks like it's coming up here. Let me go back to slide two. Oh, that looks like that's your picture, Susan. <laughs> Let me keep going. Take that off. <laughs> Sorry. I'm moving it along here. Let me go to uh, – here we go. So this is the contact information where you can reach us at Intac, sign up for our listserv, and then also reach us uh, on Facebook at OJJDPTTA. Uh, for those looking to reach out to uh, OJJDP, you may do so through the help desk at the phone number that's displayed on this slide, as well as the, uh, the information for the uh, email address here. You can reach out here. We'll be more than happy to address any questions, including uh, any type of questions you may have related to this particular webinar and accessing any handouts or documents, things of that nature. Uh, do you have a training and technical assistance need? Well, if so, please be sure to uh, submit a request via the OJJDP TTA 360 platform. Here you will be able to uh, submit your TTA request, and we'll be more than happy to link you with the correct provider for your request. Um, Again, this uh, webinar will be uh, hosted on our YouTube page. If you would like any of the supporting materials, contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk at the email address here. Uh, please take a moment to review the disclaimer on this slide as far as the attribution and the disclaimer goes. And please join us for some upcoming events that we have. Our colleagues with Zero Abuse have a few webinars coming up uh, the month of August. Uh, these webinars are indeed for prosecutors only. Um, these registration links are live, so you can click on them to register. 
Uh, same with our colleagues at the Innocent Justice Foundation. They have a webinar as well. And then we do have a webinar that is coming up with our colleagues at NDAA uh, in September, on September the, uh, the 16th, coming up soon, and we'll have information disseminated about that as well. Uh, before I let everyone go as well, we have one very last uh, poll question here. Uh, if my layout wants to switch over, here we go. And we basically want to get a good idea of how you all plan to utilize or use the uh, information that you learned for today. Um, oh, here we go. Let me do open it up for everyone. So notice that you have many options here that you can select from. So just let us know how you plan to apply the information that 